Okay, so I'm starting over. We're continuing with probability today. Um, and we're getting to a point where I feel like the class is starting to hit some of the core material of the course. And so I'm gonna start um, doing some recaps to really try to emphasize some material as we go. And I'm hoping, though this section tends to not ask as many questions, I'm hoping that leads to like a naturally formed Q&A. And if it doesn't naturally occur, then I'm gonna to try to force it to occur and sit here patiently and ask people questions or wait for people to ask questions. And then we'll spend the last um, 15 to 20 minutes doing some extra properties of probability. Um, the properties shouldn't be too difficult. I think I can draw, I think there's four properties we're gonna look at and I can draw reasonable pictures for three of them. One of them I can't draw pictures for and you just kind of have to go with it. Um, I'm not going to attempt any formal proofs of these because the proofs don't really add too much to a class like this, um, but none of them are difficult to prove if you want to give it a go. Um, okay, so how about before we get started, are there any questions on anything not directly related to probability? Like how are the videos going or how is our markdown going or LaTeX questions or R coding questions or anything like that? I'll give you all like maybe a minute just to see if there's any questions not directly related to probability. Um, I'm looking through the notes on your website and I don't think the notes for the multiplication rule notes. I just watched the videos and everything got it down, but I don't think the section notes are actually uploaded. It says not found on the website. Oh, okay. So there, uh, um, will you, hang on, just give me a second. Will you say again what notes it is you're interested in? It's the multiplication rule notes. Ah, not found. Multiplication rule. Okay. Pretty sure all the other ones work. Okay. Thank you for catching that. Um, here is, okay, so now I'm just going to share with you all how I run my <laughs> web page. Do, do, do. Sure. Okay, so that looks about right. It seems like most things are there. And thanks for your patience. The rest of you getting ready with your next questions? Because That one is now solved. Thanks for your patience. Thanks for the update. Um, obviously, there's getting to be a lot of these notes, and I'm trying to stay on top of it. But when I don't, I appreciate the heads up. OK, other questions not directly related to probability. Feel free to type them in if you don't want to speak publicly. Um, Just uh, one quick question. So when are we supposed to do that uh, tutorial thing you were talking about? Yeah, so the week after spring break, I was gonna get us started on tutorials because we're now starting 
basically the first of the, uh, let's call them important topics of the world of statistics, mathematical statistics, probability being the first real uh, important topic. So the week after spring break, I was going to tell us all about the tutorials, and I was going to list out a few of the topics that we have seen by that time. And then I was going to remind you that there's other topics to come for the rest of the semester. So um, I'm going to try to use the second half of the semester starting the week right after spring break for the tutorials. And then when we do that, you said we we're going to do it um, like right directly in our course notes or something like that, or how we're So this will be the only time I'm going to encourage you to make a uh, another R markdown document. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. Okay. So each tutorial will be its own R markdown document separate from the course notes. So you'll essentially by the end of this semester have three documents from this course, of course notes and two tutorials. Got it. Thanks, Gary. Other questions I can help us out with. Those were great ones. I appreciate it. So are the tutorials and the course notes the only assignments for us this semester? Starting, to, starting today, I'm going to post some labs. These labs, okay. oh, look, they're actually already up. So let's just go find one. Um, so I'm going to give us links to these if you don't immediately see how to find these. And the first lab is going to be on the multiplication rule, which I hope we all um, found to be not too challenging, which is my attempt here, that these labs, uh, for the most part, won't be too challenging. And they're just going to look like this. So you'll just enter your name, uh, actually your Chico State email address. You'll tell me what section you're in. You'll give me an answer to the different questions. And then down here, you'll hit submit. Now, this last question, if you can read it, I don't know how well it's coming across right now. Uh, looks particularly challenging because it is particularly challenging, um, but not all the questions in these labs will be. Most of them I hope will be fairly easy. Okay, with that said, the labs are gonna be the last component, the third component of your grade. Today, I'm going to um, send out an email that announces Wednesday's YouTube videos and the labs that are posted. Now, uh, I'm going to grade the labs towards your grade, but I'm not going to be super uh, strict on the grades about these. I'm not going to try to be mean in any way about these grades. I'm going to be try to be very generous for two reasons. One, some of the questions are tough, and I don't think you should have like the world's toughest uh, mathematical statistics questions bringing down your grades. I think if you don't get the easy ones, then sure, maybe that's going to affect your grade, but not getting the hard ones shouldn't. And two, uh, this is the first time I have ever tried labs up on my website like this in any of my classes. For the past, uh, actually, let's see, just last semester, I was doing, I was serving about a thousand students in another course that I was not teaching but I created these online labs for a friend, but this is the first time I've done it myself. So it's a little bit experimental for me. And that's the other reason I'm not gonna be super strict on the grading of these. They will count, but I'm not gonna try to penalize you if you at least tried, not penalize you too much if you at least tried. So these labs will be announced today. The due date will be the end of the semester, but obviously the closer you do them to the material you studied, the uh, easier the labs will be. So there's some encouragement to do them this week since they depend just on last week's material. But uh, in effect, they won't be due until the end of the semester. Do we only have one attempt on these or do we get multiple attempts? You get as many attempts as my server can handle. All right. And so, we will be able to check the answers we got, whether they were correct or not. No, I don't have that feature set up yet. That is a goal okay. in mind, but I don't have it set up. The best way for you to check would be to show up to office hours or um, send me an email, but I'd prefer your emails not to be, will you check every question for every lab as I go? Um, so if you want me to check, like, let's say more than two, 
I would ask you to show up to office hours and happily work out some problems with you. All right. Cool. So it's just going to be those three things that we have to keep up with this semester? Correct. Is there going to be a three final? Things. Nope. Okay. Um, my attempt around. here was to make a fair assignment given our shared circumstances in this world these days. We are all super busy in ways that have been completely unpredictable. My attempt here was to make a relatively fair course for us. I hope that's worked out for us all. If it hasn't, I don't know what to do, um, but you can certainly let me know if it hasn't and we can try to help you out. So fairness here was my goal. Hey, Edward. Yeah. Do you suggest then, so you said three documents will be due technically, the, the labs, the course notes, and then some third one that uh, slipped my mind right now, but uh, sure. so for the, for the course notes, do you want it just all in one like running PDF, like that will be probably hundreds of like pages or so? Are to you say, making like, a PDF? instead of HTML? No, I'm doing the HTML, but like mm. I've been doing a separate HTML for each week. Oh yeah, I would like one. That's helpful to know, yeah. Uh, or yeah. just to like clarify, yeah. Yeah. One of his so videos I... says how to make categories. So not all of it is viewed at the same time. Gotcha. Right. Thanks for chiming yes. in. I appreciate that. But that was exactly what I was going to say. There's um, a video specifically on the organization of the R Markdown documents because they do get to be quite overbearing after a while. All right. Thanks. Yeah. So the three things you're the three uh, files you'll create is course notes and then two tutorials for three. So here are your two tutorials and then your course notes. And these labs will be submit uh, online. So you won't get hard copies of these labs unless you fill it out and then do some sort of like print thing. But that's on you to do. Do you have the uh, link to the labs uh, on your website already? No, I don't. All of that's going to be made available when I email um, everybody okay. about later today with okay, all of the Wednesday's lecture videos. I'm trying not to like over, over email you. So I'm trying to condense today's email into one that will have Wednesday's lecture videos and the labs combined. Gotcha. Right, whether or not that's the right move, that's at least now you understand what I'm trying to do. No, no, that's helpful. So we, we don't get bombarded with emails all day. Some professors I'm trying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, technically they were actually up over the weekend, but I did also don't want to email you all on the weekend because that seems unfair. Okay, was that a good round of questions? You want me to give you like another 20 seconds in case somebody else had a final question that I haven't gotten to yet, and then we'll move on. That's a helpful link in the chat. Thank you, thank you. Uh, just real quick, you said the labs, all we have to do is answer the questions. And then hit submit. Okay. Submit at the bottom of the page. Don't forget <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> The labs don't have timers, right? Uh, what's a timer? Like, uh, like you're limited, like let's say like ten minutes to do the lab or whatever. Absolutely not. Okay, cool. <laughs> Just make sure. <laughs> yep. Trying to be fair this semester, there are no timers in any way on these labs. But I just realized that I messed up something. Now I gotta fix it. Okay, here we go. This is our recap. Uh, we're not gonna do it in orange. I like orange and all, but come on.
Okay, so we are studying this weird thing called probability, which maybe to you all wasn't well defined previously before you entered this class, but now we're learning that probability is actually a function. Probability as a function takes sets that are subsets or possibly equal to the sample space. From the sample space, it maps into a real number bounded between zero and one. I think one of the key takeaways of probability is that probability is area under a density function. And specifically, we define probabilities over sets to be equal to expectations of the indicator function on some set that is the argument to the probability function. Now, this is why we're doing a recap, because at this point, the class starts seeming kind of crazy. So essentially what we're trying to do is define a way to think about area under some density function f. So the way I'm drawing this is to imagine that we have a sample space that consists of the integers 1, 2, 3, and 4. And then we have some subset of the sample space 2 and 3. So if we were going to attempt to find the probability associated with the set A under the density function F, then we would essentially be interested in the area under just the points defined for the set A. Now the logic for the expectation here goes like this. Expectation for us is a generalization of area under a function. Expectation for us is a generalization of area under a function. Specifically, it's area under the product of the argument and the density function of interest. So in this case, the indicator function is saying only take on the value one when an element in the sample space is also contained in the set the indicator function is defined on, in that case, A. So only look at the density function, because 1 times the density function is just the density function. So only look at the area under the function at 2, which is the first element of A, and 3, which is the second and last element of A. And then we're just going to add those up because this generalization of area under the density function, when defined on a countable, which includes finite sample space, really just turns into a sum. Okay, I'm gonna say that again. I'll go slower the second time. Our generalization of area under the function, the density function, when defined on a countable, which includes finite sample space, then the expectation turns into a sum. And when the expectation is taken over a density function defined on an uncountable sample space, then it turns into an integral. So in this case, we have a countable sample space with an indicator function only defined on two and three. So we're going to focus on the probability of A is really just the area under the density function with respect to the elements in the argument to the probability. OK, so this is where we've gotten. And said, in fact, uh, you yeah. said expectations on a countable sample space turns into a what? A sum. A sum, OK. Yeah. And we're going to have um, here just to 
just to highlight. I may be taking up too much time here, but we'll try it out. We're gonna have, I'm going down to the course outline on my website. We're gonna have an entire, okay, so like we've seen expectation, we're looking at probability. We're gonna have entire weeks devoted to other expected values. So my thinking here is even if it doesn't quite make sense by the time we've seen probability, we will look at expected values again, again, and again, and again. It's the theme of the course. So if it doesn't yet make sense, don't worry. There's plenty of time for it to, to sink in. Expectations taken with respect to density functions defined on countable spaces turn into sums. Okay, so at this point, we are even starting to explore exact density functions for which this expectation might be taken. So this week is almost entirely expectations of indicator functions for discrete uniform distributions, for discrete uniform distributions. That's what this entire week is, is an example of probability over discrete uniform distributions. And it turns out uh, it's just counting problems for expectations over discrete uniform distributions. So the counting problems get fairly challenging. So challenging, you will need the multiplication rule and combination lessons in order to do the calculations appropriately. Hence, all the material last week is going to aid us in probability statements over discrete uniform distributions. We will also look at, in due time, probability statements with respect to the binomial distribution. But we probably won't spend too much time doing probability statements with continuous distributions because continuous distributions have expectations that turn into integrals, and the integrals get really nasty really quick. And I think, in my opinion, it's just kind of a waste of time uh, doing the grunt work to get through them. I think there's better things to do to understand conceptually with our time. So we won't do too many probability problems um, for continuous distributions by hand. But this week, we will focus on probability problems on the discrete uniform. And in a future lab, we will focus on probability problems from the binomial distribution. OK, so here we are in our recap. Probability is a set function that's different than most functions you've looked at. In most functions, uh, take numbers as arguments. Probability takes sets. The sets are subsets or equal to the sample space. And the probability function maps from sets in the sample space to a real number in between 0 and 1. It does this by finding area under a density function. And from here, we started exploring axioms of probability. These axioms are like rules for which your probability function must apply. So let's just put this up so we have it as a reference. So when you write that, why don't you write A and S? Because why using... don't I put A here? Yeah, why don't you put both A and S? Because the idea is it takes arbitrary sets that live in the sample space. So it's starting in the complete set uh, space, S. So it could take this set, or this set, or this set, or this set. And it would map any of those 
to the real numbers. Okay. Yeah, so it's like, that makes um, sense. Yeah, so it's like a generalization. We start somewhere in this set and we end up somewhere in this set. I'm thinking, wouldn't it make more sense to write the power set of S mapping to zero one since it Great maps question, every Alex. element of that to an element of zero one? Great question. Um, since you know the definition of the power set, I will answer your question for you specifically or anybody else that knows the definition of the power set. Technically, it does not map the power set to the real numbers. It maps something much more complex defined from the sample space to the real numbers bounded between 0 and 1. They call it a Borel sigma algebra. And if you want to get into the complexity of it, the um, this book here is an excellent introduction to that material that is more rigorous than the way I am defining probability. So okay, that makes more sense. The uh, power set is too big a set for probability to apply nicely to. So we restrict probability functions actually to Borel sigma algebras defined on the sample space to the um, real interval zero to one. So the Borel sigma algebra is slightly smaller in very specific ways than the power set. Okay, so if you were to do the power set and put in S that's the cardinality, the real numbers, you get an input that's way bigger than the real numbers, like a left two or something that you could not put inside of zero one. Is that why? Uh, no, let me get to proper axiom number three, and then I'll address why you can't define probability on the power set. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Great, no, I love it. Those are great questions. Okay, the first axiom of probability is the probability of the entire sample space is equal to one. And this is essentially saying probabilities are bounded above by one. We can't have probabilities bigger than one. Alex, uh, this axiom would actually hold for the power set, could theoretically hold for the power set, okay? The second axiom is the probability of arbitrary subsets of the sample space must be non-negative, greater than or equal to zero. And that holds for any subset possibly equal to the sample space. This is essentially like, say, like saying probabilities are bounded below by zero. Probabilities have to be between zero and one. Okay, the third axiom is definitely the hardest to conceptualize, but we will spend some time today looking at a property of this third axiom that will help it make a little sense, I think. If you're interested in the probability of a union of sets, and that's a countable union of sets, then this is essentially like adding up the probability of the individual sets as long as, okay, any a n is a subset of s, and for any i and any j, the intersection of those sets is empty. So long as your two sets, your sets are pairwise disjoint, that is no two sets overlap, then you can calculate the probability of the union as the sum of the individual probabilities. Now, the reason we put this as an axiom 
Think of it as like a requirement on the probability function is because this one intuitively makes sense. And the intuition will come along with one of the properties we look at uh, later on in this lecture. Now, Alex, your question is, why can't we define uh, probability functions on the power set of S? Theoretically, there are times when this intuitive axiom won't hold for crazy sets in the power set of the sample space. And we want this to intuitively hold. So mathematicians have like gone out of their way to restrict the what should really be here, taking the place of the sample space of S with a Borel sigma algebra, which is like cleverly defined so that it's the biggest possible set of sets of the sample space such that this intuitive de definition still holds. Cool, thanks for your patience on that answer. Okay, we've had some excellent questions uh, from my recap. I greatly appreciate those, those were great. If we don't have excellent questions, I'm still happy to field them. Now is my time when I'd like to pause for just like a minute or two and let you all ask questions about where we're at in this class, what probability is doing, or how things are going. How are the videos going from last week? It was kind of like a break from probability for a bit. Silence. Okay, that was one minute. I can't stall for the rest of the class, but I can at least stall for like another minute till someone gets the courage up to ask another question. Your question doesn't have to be on the same level as Alex's question about crazy things called sigma algebras. Okay, then I'm gonna move on. Here we go. We're gonna start in into properties of probability. I'm gonna to try to draw us pictures as we go because I think the pictures are almost more informative than the statements. Let A be a subset possibly equal to the uh, entire sample space then the probability of A complement is equal to one minus the probability of A. Now this one I don't think is terribly difficult to see in terms of a picture. And then I'll just hint at how you could prove this if you wanted to. We have some entire sample space, S. And we have from axiom number one that the probability of the entire sample space is one. So really, you can think of that one right there as the probability of the entire sample space. And then if we had some set A, and I'll draw A inside of itself, just so we can differentiate it from A complement. So A is all the stuff inside this, uh, it's almost a circle. And A complement is all the stuff outside of that circle. Then all we're really saying, just by rearranging this equation, is the probability of the entire sample space is just the probability of A plus the probability of A complement. You can break up this one, this probability of one, into two pieces, the probability of A and the probability of all the things not in A. So hopefully that one is fairly intuitive. 
I will offer an example because we have seen this already. We have seen this in the case of the Bernoulli distribution. So consider the Bernoulli distribution with the uh, probability of observing a one as P. The probability of, observ of observing a one is P. Then, because the entire sample space is just zero and one, the probability of zero is one minus P. Now look, if you just define A equal to the value one, then A complement is equal to the set with only the value zero in it. And we have exactly what we just saw as some sort of complement rule. Okay. Now you all ask fewer questions than the last class. So I'm just gonna pretend like you all asked, can we see that with numbers instead of letters? Hey, Edward, can we see that with numbers instead of letters? Josiah, yes, absolutely. Awesome. Consider the Bernoulli distribution with the probability P equal to one fourth. Then the probability, so this is like um, an unfair coin, right? This is like a coin that flips heads, which we'll call one, uh, one quarter of the time. So it's like a coin that flips heads with 25% chance. How'd that go? Did numbers help? Did numbers work better than letters? That makes sense in my mind. Great, thanks. Other people's too? Yeah, I get that. Thanks. I'll trust that everybody else is nodding along. There we go in the chat. Yup. Appreciate it. I don't care how you do it, whether it's in the chat or uh, if you're willing to speak up. I appreciate the feedback. Nod, <laughs> appreciate it. Okay, here we go. We're going to move on then. We're going to continue in properties of probability. The probability of the empty set, and I'll just write out the empty set in two different ways because some people seem to be preferring it differently, is zero. The probability of the empty set is zero. And this is the one property I don't know how to draw. I don't know how to give you a picture of a set that has no things in it other than saying, look, here are two squiggly braces, two curly braces, which we use to denote a set. And there's no things in that set. The probability of the set that contains no things is equal to zero. You could say something like, if you roll a dice, the probability of rolling none of the sides is zero. Sure. And I'm assuming your your die cannot land on an edge. It's 
got to land on a face flat down. Does that example work for people? I at least saw some nods on that one. Good example, Alex, thanks. Okay, we're just gonna keep them going then. Suppose A is a strict subset of B, which itself is a subset or equal to the sample space. Then the probability of A is less than or equal to the probability of B. So this one's not bad. We can draw this one out in two different ways. And I think it kind of makes sense in both ways. If you have a subset B and that set contains another set A, then indeed the probability of the smaller set is going to be a smaller number than the probability of the bigger set. The probability of the smaller set is guaranteed to be less than or equal to the probability of the bigger set. And I think in a picture that kind of makes sense. B is a bigger set, so its probability should be bigger. And it probably will be. You can also consider this on a plot, remembering the fact that probability is area under a function. So if you had some continuous distribution with density function f, and you had a set a that consisted of the interval a1 to a2, then the probability a is guaranteed to be less than the probability of a set b that is an interval from B1 to B2. If you're taking the area under a function of a bigger set, then that's guaranteed to have at least as big a probability as the smaller set. So you said a subset of B, but a can actually be equal to B still? Or the probabilities, I mean? The probabilities could be equal. Let me see if I can think of an example of that. OK, Jacob, are you OK with the distinction between parentheses and curly braces? Yeah. Oh, and uh, square brackets? Sorry, I can yeah, draw better right. than I can speak. Cool. So in this case, A is a strict subset of B, but on continuous distributions, they will have equal probability for the reason, consider the point C, how much area is under the curve at the point C? Zero. Zero. So the exact points B1 and B2 on a continuous distribution will add no probability. The exact points B1 and B2 will add no probability under a continuous distribution because the integral at specific points is zero. And yet um, A is a strict subset of B. So A is not equal to the set of B, but the probabilities can be equal? Correct. And this is the example. Okay. A, some interval from A1 to A2. Uh, let me see if I can make this example even more clear. Sorry, I should have done this sooner.
Yeah, I was wondering because I was kind of trying to picture it the same as what you have drawn. But you mean like the points being the same, but one is included and one is not included. Correct. For the end caps. Correct. Yeah, I had to refine my example. Uh, thank you, Josiah and Jacob, for staring blankly until I realized that my example could have been more clear. So I, I mean exactly that. A1 to A2 are some numbers. I don't care what numbers they are. But for the set A, we are excluding A1 and A2 themselves. The single points A1 and A2 are excluded. That's what the parentheses are to imply. B is the interval A1 to A2, including A1 and A2, including those specific points. But A1 as a specific point contributes no probability. And A2 as a specific point contributes no probability. So, so could you like put A1, that into an example? Like an actual real world example? Oh, sure. Oh, you mean like not just draw you more pictures? Yeah, like a real world example, like explaining how the edge wouldn't be, I, like I kind of understand conceptually where a point doesn't have probability because the width of it is zero. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying, struggling to like understand that like actually in the real world. Mm -hmm. Maybe if it was to do with some group of people? I think the easiest way to think about it would be um, if you were measuring like temperature of some substance, theoretically, that temperature could take on any decimal representation. It could have an infinite number of decimals. Even if we can't measure the temperature at such a precision, it theoretically could have a temperature with an infinite number of repeating decimals. The probability that you get exactly that one temperature is so unlikely that would just say it has zero probability. Was that like a close enough to a good enough example? Yeah, so it's kind of just like, technically we could say that they're different, but it's just so unlikely that we just say it's basically zero. Right. Yeah, I can, I can deal with that. Cool. Okay, I was hoping to have more than two minutes for my last property, but that's okay. Oh, actually, I have two properties left, but one of them is super easy. So I'll just write it down and let you all look at it later. And then we'll go straight to the last one. Suppose A is a subset of the sample space and B is a different subset of the sample space. The probability of A union B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus their intersection. And so I encourage you to go look at axiom one and remind yourself why this is different. I mean, axiom three and remind yourself why this is different than axiom three. And the hint is for axiom three, the answer is for axiom three, the sets A and B have to be non-overlapping. But here is a property of probability that says the probability of a union of two sets is equal to A. Now think of A as the circle with a little bit that overlaps B plus B which is the right circle with a little bit that overlaps A. Now, why do we have to subtract off the intersection? 
Because it would be double what it actually is. Fantastic. When you add up A and B, you'd essentially count the intersection twice. So we got to subtract it off once in order for this probability rule to hold. Okay, all well, that is 350 on my clock. Uh, I have some quick examples. If A is a subset of B, or if they're not overlapping from section one's lecture notes, I don't encourage you to watch the video because it's identical to this video. But if you want to go pull up their lecture notes, there's two more examples following from this rule. They're not hard to draw yourself. You could probably do them if you just sat there and thought about it. But it'd be um, if you want the answers, they're in the other section's notes. Okay, I'm going to stop recording now. I'll happily hang around for another five minutes. If